Many unsolved cases are hampered by a lack of evidence or a lack of definite suspects. Others are, on occasion, underreported and simply don't reach enough people to raise awareness. In today's case, however, none of these happen to be an issue. So why, after 35 years, is the case of Diane Suzuki's disappearance still unsolved? If you were a resident of Hawaii in the mid-1980s, there's a good chance that you heard about the massive effort to locate a young woman named Diane Suzuki. Diane was a 19-year-old resident of Halawa in Honolulu, Hawaii. She attended the University of Hawaii at Manoa and worked as a part-time dance instructor at Rosalie Woodson Dance Academy in Aiea. On July 6, 1985, a Saturday, Diane had made plans with three of her friends to drive to the north shore of Oahu after she'd gotten off of work. Her shift ended that day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, however, when her friends had arrived at the studio around 3.15, they couldn't find any sign of her. They searched the area to no avail and found that all of her belongings, including her purse and keys, had been left behind. Despite asking the few employees still around the studio at that time, nobody had any idea where she had gone. In just 15 minutes, it seemed that Diane had completely vanished. Diane's parents, Masaharu and Yuri Suzuki, decided to come to the dance studio and park out front, waiting in the hopes that their daughter would soon return from wherever she had gone. But she never did. Susan Suzuki, Diane's sister, became the family's spokesperson. She tirelessly worked alongside both the media and the police in an effort to locate Diane, and news of Diane's disappearance spread rapidly across the islands. The case was very big news, widely publicized at the time, and public support was immense. Over 20,000 missing persons flyers were printed by the Suzukis in an effort to reach out to anyone who might have information that would help the case. Despite the apparent lack of evidence as to where Diane had gone, that wasn't to say that there weren't any leads to be found. As a matter of fact, investigators did have one prime suspect in the case, a man by the name of Dewey Hamasaki. One of the case's witnesses was another dance instructor who worked with Diane, who stated that they last saw Suzuki just after her shift had ended, entering the hallway that led to the upstairs dance studio's bathroom. The dance instructor left the building afterwards, and stated that the only other person in the studio at that time besides Diane was Dewey Hamasaki. Hamasaki, a photographer at Rosalie Woodson Dance Academy and an acquaintance of Diane's, was indeed present at the time. One of Diane's friends, after arriving at the studio and beginning to search for her, asked Hamasaki if he knew where Diane was. Hamasaki replied that she had left. Another of Diane's friends went upstairs afterwards and asked Hamasaki the same question, to which he replied that he had not seen Diane. Diane's friend noticed a cut on the man's finger and asked about it. Hamasaki replied that he had tripped while carrying a pair of scissors and cut himself. As they waited in the dance studio parking lot for their daughter to return, Diane's parents reported seeing Dewey Hamasaki and two other individuals, his father and sister, carrying a large trunk out of the studio and loading it onto a vehicle. However, the Suzukis thought nothing of this at the time. Two days after Diane's disappearance, Hamasaki was taken in to be interviewed by detectives in charge of the case. He had scratches on his back, both of his arms and left hand, in addition to a cut on his left hand, which he attributed to being from a rooster that attacked him. Hamasaki was also noted to have failed a polygraph test administered during his interview. However, with no hard evidence and a lack of criminal history on Hamasaki's part, the suspect was released. Knowing that Diane had last been seen heading into the hallway leading to the studio's bathroom, the police at least knew where to search next. They found that the bathroom's door jam had been broken, a sign of forced entry that the studio's employees and regulars insisted had not been present just days prior. Just as alarming was the presence of an unknown, dark substance speckled between the tiles on the wall and floors, which investigators later identified as blood. These discoveries aside, without a body or a suspect, it seemed that Diane's trail was beginning to go cold. And for quite some time, that's exactly what happened. It wasn't until five years after Diane's disappearance when the case would take on a new life, one that came from the invention of a substance known as luminol. Luminol is a compound that reacts with iron and glows blue when it comes into contact with it, often used by forensic investigators to detect trace amounts of blood. Investigators immediately saw how this could be used to further Diane's investigation, and managed to gain a search warrant to further investigate the dance studio with relative ease. Detectives were initially discouraged to find that the tile in the dance studio's bathroom had recently been replaced with vinyl. 
However, one officer suggested that they remove the vinyl and use luminol on the surface beneath the flooring. What they found was jarring. The glow of the luminol formed a checkerboard outline that covered nearly all of the floor in front of the toilet. This signified to investigators that enough blood had pooled in the area at some point to seep through the original tile and onto the concrete underneath, but that the blood had evidently been cleaned up at some point. They spoke with both the studio's employees and recurring students, none of whom recalled having to clean up such a large amount of blood at any point in time. They had no explanations as to why it was there. With this discovery, the case was reclassified from a missing persons investigation to that of suspected homicide. At the same time, investigators seemed unsatisfied with completely writing off their prime suspect. So, around the same time that they had applied for a search warrant of Rosalie Woodson Dance Academy, they also applied to search Dewey Hamasaki's properties. In his book, Honolulu Homicide, Murder and Mayhem in Paradise, then-Lieutenant of the Honolulu Police Department, Gary A. Diaz, states that the request, before it could even be taken to a judge, was denied by the police department's captain, who could not be convinced that investigators had enough probable cause to conduct a search of the suspect property. Further conflict had also arisen in the form of unwanted attention when a member of the police department alerted the media that a search warrant had been obtained for the dance studio, leading to this information going out to the general public. Innocuous as this may have seemed on its own, it would end up potentially having severe consequences for Diane Suzuki's case. Nine months after the Luminol investigation, police again attempted to obtain a search warrant for Hamasaki's properties, and this time they were successful. A massive sweep of Hamasaki's home and its surrounding areas ensued, which lasted an entire day. Says Gary A. Diaz in his book, For reasons unknown, one officer decided to knock down the stump of an old banana tree he discovered. He dug around a little and, to everyone's surprise, found some clothing. This was exciting because Diane Suzuki was described as wearing similar clothing on the day she disappeared. It was even more exciting because the sizes of the clothing were the right size for Diane. Unfortunately, there was no way we could tie those articles of clothing to Diane Suzuki. They were degraded somewhat, and family members couldn't state for certain that they actually did belong to her. They would remain circumstantial evidence. This wasn't the only discovery that the search turned up. Investigators also came across a rock wall and found the differences in colors between the rocks unusual, as if it had recently been expanded. Upon removing the rocks, they found loosely packed dirt, twigs, and leaves several feet deep. Hamasaki's family claimed that the wall was decades old, however, this was contradicted by the discovery. Samples of the dirt were taken, and it was concluded that the area had been disturbed somewhere from six to nine months prior, harrowingly around the same time frame that news of police searching the dance studio had gone public. Investigators felt that this, combined with the delay in obtaining a search warrant for Hamasaki's property, gave the family time to hide the victim's body. In the words of Gary Diaz, we believed we had found Diane Suzuki's gravesite. In addition to this, Dewey Hamasaki's lawyer, Keith Shigatomi, attempted to speak with the investigators off the record and inquired about having charges lowered to manslaughter if the suspect was to plead guilty. The investigators, still intent on finding Suzuki's body, rejected this plea. In 1993, Eight years after Diane's disappearance, city prosecutor Keith Konishiro, who was a close friend of the Suzuki family, brought the investigation's results and the suspects before several grand jury sessions. Despite his best efforts, there simply wasn't enough damning evidence to charge the Hamasakis with murder. After four days and more than 300 hours of testimony, no charges were filed. Since that day 27 years ago, the investigation has been at a standstill. There have been other proposed explanations as to what happened to Diane Suzuki, however, few have stuck. One such theory suggests that Diane was a victim of the Honolulu Strangler. The Strangler, Hawaii's first known serial killer, was responsible for the deaths of five women between 1985 and 1986 and is still at large. However, little evidence suggests that there could be a link between Diane and the Honolulu Strangler, so this theory has mostly been disregarded. Another potential lead regarded an early eyewitness account. Diane was reported to have been seen outside the dance studio at 3 o'clock, speaking to a man beside a two-tone Volkswagen with a lightning bolt design. However, Lieutenant Gary Diaz believes that some investigators wrongly latched onto the angle of this unidentified man's involvement and ignored the overwhelming evidence that the investigation uncovered. The Suzuki family held a memorial for Diane on July 6, 1997, the 12th anniversary of her disappearance. 
Diane's parents have both since passed away, her mother Yuri in 1998 and her father Masaharu in 2016, as did Gary A. Diaz in July of 2020. Diane Suzuki's case, still unsolved 35 years later, was widely publicized at the time and notorious for what several felt was its mishandling. Many expressed outrage that the Hamasaki family faced no charges. Others felt that the police hadn't done enough. The investigators themselves felt that their efforts had been impeded by their inability to obtain a search warrant for the Hamasaki's property in a timely manner. Indeed, a variety of factors plagued the initial investigation. At the end of the day, what many would see as damning evidence just wasn't concrete enough in the eyes of the court system to justify a trial. Diane Suzuki's parents faced the horrors of losing their beloved daughter and left this world without ever knowing what truly happened to her. There are still many who hold out hope for a resolution to the case, both in the name of justice and so that Diane's friends and surviving family might finally find peace. If you have any further information regarding Diane Suzuki's case, please contact the Honolulu Police Department at 808-529-3394. Thank you for watching, and stay safe out there.